and at kpfa.org for November 12th, Robert Reich. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1 p.m. Stay tuned next for Project Censored. Welcome to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Today's program, we focus on critical pedagogy and the role of radical education in reclaiming democracy against the shadows of fascism. We're joined for the hour by Professor Henry Giraud who has written uh, prolifically about these matters over the last several decades. So today on the program, Critical Pedagogy and Henry Giroux. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff with Peter Phillips. Today on the program, we're joined by Dr. Henry A. Giroux. He currently holds the McMaster University Chair for Scholarship and Public Interest in English and Cultural Studies Department and the Paulo Freire Chair in Critical Pedagogy at the McMaster Institute for Innovation and Excellence in Teaching and Learning. He's a distinguished visiting professor at Ryerson University, and his recent books include The Violence of Organized Forgetting, Thinking Beyond America's Disimagination Machine, Zombie Politics in the Age of Casino Capitalism, Disposable Futures, The Seduction of Violence in the Age of Spectacle, and Dangerous Thinking in the Age of New Authoritarianism. Henry Giro is also a member of the Board of Directors at Truthout, and his website is henryagiro.com. Henry Giro, welcome. Thank you for having me on, Mickey. Henry, hi, this is Peter Phillips. Let's give listeners a little background on critical theory and the origins of that, and then what you mean by critical pedagogy. One of the things that I wanted to do in the late 70s, when many of us were concerned about the, the question of education in the United States, particularly with the rise of Ronald Reagan, and, uh, you know, the Thatcher-Reagan sort of uh, marriage. One of the things that was happening was that on the left, there was an enormous attempt to view schools simply as prisons and as sort of black boxes in which power was sort of equated with domination and nothing else. And on the other side, of course, there were people who were simply arguing that schools should simply train people for the workforce. I wanted to look at different traditions that offered both a, a language of critique and a language of possibility for being able to do that. And I, I was one of the people, of course, who went right to the Frankfurt School and looked at Adorno and, you know, Horkheimer and a whole range of people who, it seemed to me, offered, you know, a, a really valuable vocabulary for talking about schools, particularly as institutions that were involved in the production of particular kinds of subjects and desires and, you know, the role of culture and subjectivity and what that mean and how to link that to larger questions in which the school became, you know, part of a, a much broader relationship of both domination and possibility. And so, I, you know, you know, in theory and resistance, there was an, an attempt to bring that tradition into the American fold so that it became part of the dialogue of critical educational theory. And I, I think it was actually largely successful for many people. Henry, what do you mean by ideological control and uh, domination by culture and by institutions for, for human beings and society? I think that what many of us became aware of, particularly after reading people like Gramsci and people like, like Alter Sur, was that schools were, were not just simply about instruction. I mean, that schools were, in a sense, ideological state apparatuses. They were institutions that promoted legitimate particular forms of knowledge, that they sanctioned particular kinds of social relationships, highly competitive generally, knowledge that basically mirrored the status quo. They sanctioned and legitimated and taught particular values. And 
and had a certain understanding of what the future should look like. And I think that in that sense, it became very clear that you had to talk about schools in ways that could not be separated from questions of power and particular kinds of visions that people had about what schools do and what they should produce. And so we were trying to unravel that and sort of try to understand what the hidden curriculum was in many of these schools. You know, what were they trying to teach? How did they correlate with larger assumptions about the dominant society? In what ways were they stifling the imagination and critical thinking? In what ways were they not becoming democratic public spheres, but actually just simply workstations to segue people into the workforce? And so I think that, you know, particularly people who are concerned with critical pedagogy, people like Paulo Freire, myself, uh, a number of others, were trying to figure out how we could talk about pedagogy in a way that was both inspiring and energizing. One that allowed young people to be critically engaged, have a sense of social responsibility, and to be able to connect learning to social change. And I think that uh, that tradition over the, over the last 40 years has spread wildly in many ways in trying to help educators to understand that there, there are ways of teaching that don't have to stifle the imagination, that don't sort of in some way turn students, young people, into simply trainees for the workforce. And that approaches like high stakes testing and so forth and so on are really pedagogies of repression. They have nothing to do with empowerment. They have nothing to do with, with giving students the conditions that they need to be critical to self-individual and social agents. It was very clear to us that schools at their core was really a struggle over agency. What kind of individuals were being produced? You know, what kinds of understandings of the relationship between themselves and others did they have? What kind of understanding did they have about their relationship between themselves and the larger world? Critical pedagogy, of course, was an intervention into that to try to make it clear that they had to be critically engaged. They had to interrogate all, all kinds of truths, so that everything should be questioned, that questions of debate, thoughtfulness, and exchange had to be central to the educational process itself. Henry Giraud, both Peter and I, professors uh, teaching, you know, media, sociology of media and so forth and political economy, history. I also teach critical thinking. So couldn't agree more with the statement you were making about what higher education ought to look like, what it's supposed to do and, and how it's supposed to empower young people and students of all ages. And certainly really is kind of a cornerstone of, of the commons of, of democratic culture and society. All the more reason one might suspect that sort of the corporate hegemonic control over our society is really trying to close that that avenue uh, and really kind of turning schools into, as you said, workstations, training people for, you know, mindless jobs for corporations and so forth. Worse than that, and you've used this phrase, I believe, not so long ago, it's a school to prison pipeline. Can you talk a little about that? Well, I think that when we talk about public education in particular, what we often see in public education are really schools that are tied to punitive practices that are racially biased, particularly after Columbine. I mean, the emergence actually in the 1970s with these, these laws that were passed to prevent guns from coming into schools and then got expanded to include things like paper clips as dangerous weapons. And what often happened was that these zero tolerance policies were implemented in ways that fell disproportionately upon poor minorities, African Americans, uh, you know, Latinos, and particularly, in, and what's often not mentioned, kids with disabilities. So that what the schools became in many ways, particularly schools in poor urban areas, they became lockdown stations. They were modeled after prisons with all kinds of security measures and police in the class Rooms and kids were being expelled, kids were being suspended. But in many cases, what has been horrifying is that we've increasingly seen with this growing police presence in the schools is that students are now seen as criminals and, and are targeted for the most trivial kinds of behaviors in ways in which they're not only handcuffed, punished, but they're ushered into the criminal justice system. And that record follows them around for their lives. And I think that we've just seen that, of course, with this recent horrible South Carolina video of this cop sort of body slamming a young African-American woman to the ground because of all things she wouldn't hand over her phone to a teacher. I mean, that's really a reason for being arrested and, and abused brutally, isn't it? But I think all of this says something about the transformation of American schools. And I don't think you can uncouple that transformation from something that's happening in society. And I, and I think that as the social state is entirely undermined, what you then have is the rise of the punishing state. So increasingly more social problems are solved by criminalizing behaviors associated with those problems. If you're poor and you're walking on the wrong side of the street, you get punished. You know, if you're black 
and you make eye contact with a cop, you end up potentially being dead, as Freddie Gray ended up. And it goes on and on. But I think the thing that is really clear in light of your question, and given that history that I've just mentioned, is that schools are seen as dangerous in this day and age. I mean, the, the last thing that the financial elite want to produce are people who basically are not part of the ruling elite, who could be possibly educated to hold power accountable. I mean, what do you think high stakes testing is about? I mean, it's really about killing the imagination. That's what it's about. It's about disciplining people. What do you think that these huge debts that people have in higher education are about? They're about making sure that people never go into public service, that they have to work in jobs and where they're going to be able to pay back it's horrible, often fifty, twenty-five to $50,000 loans that they're carrying around for most of their lives. So I think that in that sense, we really have seen an attack on public and higher education in ways that I think are almost unprecedented. But, you know, you want to remember something, and I think that most people forget this. The 60s scared the out of conservatives. They never got over it. The very thought that people could be educated from multiple ethnic, racial, and class positions and be able to come into the university and to raise important questions, to fight for expanding the curriculum, to fight for inclusion, to fight for equity. They saw that as one of the most dangerous threats that the financial elite could possibly confront. You can see it in the Trilateral Commission's notion that in the 1960s with Huntington, who argued that democracy is an excess and we have to contain it. You see it in the Powell memo in 1971, where they're saying, hey, look, we really need to take over these campuses. We really need to make sure that these kids fall in full step with what we call hypercapitalism and free market society. And it's just gotten worse, you know. That's all. Henry Giroux, we see in Wisconsin the war on tenure. You mentioned already the high stakes testing, the Gates Foundation, the privatization of education. I mean, that's just, again, a, a theft of the commons of the right to education, the right of participation in, in democracy, the right to think freely and express oneself. One of your recent books, one of your many books, I believe you have over 60 books now. You have a book called The Violence of Organized Forgetting, Thinking Beyond America's Disimagination Machine. Could you tie in the thesis of, of what you're talking about in that book to, to what we're talking about here? I think that what we have to remember is that historical memory is dangerous because it often has the power to resurrect narratives that people in power don't want to hear. And at the same time, the concept of disimagination machine points to what I call a form of public pedagogy that few people really want to talk about. I mean, Raymond Williams talked about what he called permanent education, the kind of education that takes place as a result of the educational force of the culture itself. And, and Gramsci, of course, talked about this, and other people have, have talked about the culture as a, a vast pedagogical machine. T. Wright Mills talked about the cultural apparatuses and how crucial they were in promoting a, a certain level of conformity and squelching dissent and limiting the frames of reference that people could operate out of. And I, and I think that what I did in that book was I really tried to resurrect those traditions and talk about how today this neoliberal disimagination machine as it works through the corporate media and screen culture is just overwhelming. I mean, the emphasis on privatization, the emphasis on self-interest, the individualization of the social, the concept that individuals have to bear the burden of all problems that they confront, that we can't translate private issues into larger social issues, that profit-making is the essence of democracy, consumerism, the only obligation of citizenship. I mean, these are all part of a very, very powerful narrative that we see pumped out endlessly in the culture. And I think that what the left has often ignored and what I write about in this book is precisely that, that, that they don't understand pedagogy as really central to politics itself, because pedagogy basically is about changing the way people think. It's about raising the level of consciousness. It's about offering alternatives to people in which they can identify with those alternatives in ways in which the conditions that we're talking about become meaningful to their own lives. We can't just talk about economic structures. The crisis of economics is not matched by the crisis of ideas. And I think that I, I tried to make that very, very clear in that book by drawing on work that I've been doing for about 40 years. Henry, you write about radical democracy. You write right. about pedagogy as instructional ideas of people coming to an aware of, of pedagogy that, that issues a practice of freedom right. that's rooted in resurgence or insurrectional democracy. In other words, you're saying grassroots people democratically have the right to challenge inequality, top-down corporate power, and that should be taught in the schools, and that should be a major part of it. And then, of course, corporate power is trying to reverse that and dominate and control what's going on in universities and education. So where does that leave us? I mean, certainly higher education is has become, I, I have a quote here from you, a private right to serve individual and corporate interests 
and I see that uh, certainly in the California State University system, which is one of the largest in the world. Um, the you know, presidents that are corporate they run universities like corporations, faculty that's now two thirds untenured lecturers. It's completely changed, and it's terribly discouraging and scary. So wh where are we going? How do we resist this in the ways that you are encouraging? It's a great question, Peter, and I and I think that there are a couple of issues to explore here. I mean, I, I think first let's begin with a presupposition that the universities are absolutely vital, as you suggested, to any notion of democracy. They often provide the formative culture that enables people to both take the question of democracy seriously and to address whatever problems emerge at, that basically are attempting to undermine it. At the same time, the universities have been increasingly corporatized since the 1980s. My position on that is that that trend, while it's pretty intense and pretty widespread, has not completely transformed all universities into simply corporate entities. Universities are still sites of struggle. You can still find departments and faculty like myself who are teaching in these places who are doing everything they can to try to educate students in spite of the governing bodies that now mimic corporate culture, right? So the struggle over universities has to continue. We just can't say that because they're corporatized that there's no point and bothering with them anymore. I don't want to say that, and I don't want to suggest that. Secondly, I think that what becomes clear is that if we're going to talk just about the universities for a minute, that faculty have got to be able to do something to be able to wage this kind of struggle in a way that's meaningful. And I think there are three things that they need to do. First of all, they need to write in a way that allows them to be public intellectuals, to connect their work to broader audiences, so that people have some sort of sense of why the university needs to be saved. I mean, I think that when you often ask professors, you know, what did they do, and what are they doing to somehow be able to justify the very conditions of their own labor, they don't know what to say. They, they, you know, they write for five people. You know, they, they, they're caught in, in careerism, professionalization, or unfortunately, 70% of them are so involved in just trying to survive because they're on a part-time, operating on a part-time basis, that there's very little that they can do, and I have enormous sympathy for them. That's the first thing. Secondly, it seems to me that contingent faculty and full-time faculty have got to align themselves with larger social movements. They've got to align themselves with unions. They've got to allow themselves with youth movements. They've just got to bring pressure to bear on these universities in ways that does not rely upon simply the isolated power of the faculty. It's not enough. And I think thirdly, we have to see international movements emerge in which we can work across national boundaries to be able to engage in a defense of public goods and a defense of the commons. If we can't find a language by which we can insert schools as part of something much larger that doesn't just benefit people who go to school, but benefits the society in general, if not the world in general, around the question of global democracy. I think we're in big trouble. Now, the fourth thing. The other thing is, let's assume for a moment that we take seriously that the most important forms of domination are not only, not only economic, but also intellectual and pedagogical, and lie on the side of belief and persuasion. I think then it, that means it's important to recognize that intellectuals have an enormous responsibility for challenging these forms of domination, not only in schools, but through alternative media. We've seen the rise of online media. We've seen the rise of programs like this in ways that offer enormous opportunities to all of a sudden be able to to speak to a broader public in a way that people like myself and Chomsky and Zinn, we couldn't do that 20 years ago. Nobody would listen to us. Nobody would put us on the air. Nobody would publish us. Now, I can't go online without finding an article a week by Noam Chomsky. And I think this is something we've got to begin to take seriously. You know, we really have to mobilize and academics to become public intellectuals and to use these outlets in ways in which they can provide an alternative voice that can really challenge this really stupid, idiotic, ignorant corporate media. My God, it's hard to watch. The low level that this stuff reaches for now is beyond comprehension, right? We're speaking with Professor Henry Giraud, and after the brief musical break, we're going to come back and talk about the corporate media which is certainly something that we do regularly on the Project Censored show. Stay with us. Yeah. 
Welcome back to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff with Peter Phillips. We're speaking today with Professor Henry Giroux. He currently holds the McMaster University Chair for Scholarship in the Public Interest in the English and Cultural Studies Department and the Paulo Freire Chair in Critical Pedagogy at the McMaster Institute for Innovation and Excellence in Teaching and Learning. He's Distinguished Visiting Professor at Ryerson University, author of 60-some books and 400 articles. And we're talking today, uh, well, about all things cr- uh, critical and pedagogical, talking about education, talking about actually encroaching fascism in our society. We're going to get more into that subject here momentarily. But before we left off at the break, Henry Giraud, you started to talk about the corporate news media and the low-hanging fruit and sort of what we call the junk food news, news abuse propaganda here at Project Censored. Can you go on with that theme? Well, I probably won't say anything that you haven't said much better. But I think that what we have seen is we have seen such a narrowing in the corporate media of any kind of critical analysis. It's so profoundly disturbing that I would argue that it really represents what Hannah Harant once said in providing the conditions for fascism because it's really truly uh, what I would call an ecology of thoughtlessness. Or one could go further and say it's a systemic attempt to cloud issues over in ways that it becomes difficult for people to assume any kind of critical sort of posture towards them. We can go either way. I think both positions fit two different sides of the same coin. What I do think is that one of the things that I, I see is, is there is an anti-intellectualism in the culture that is probably magnified in scope by reality TV, celebrity culture, you know, Hollywood films. But it's now seeped down into the media in ways in which everything is about performance and nothing is about substance. And this is all done in the name of balance or in the name of a kind of faux objectivity. We get people who allegedly could appear in the fashion magazine sort of reading scripts about the news, or we get NBC, CBS, ABC with their star reporters really talking nonsense. I mean, never saying anything of any any worth. And, and basically promoting a culture that pedagogically, I mean, there's no other word to use for this that is not just about conformity and anti-intellectualism. It's really about an attack on reason. I think that the shouting matches on Fox, the idiocy on CNN, the, the, the kind of bland nonsense that parades as insightfulness on NBC, these are all stage performances because they have to operate within an ideological framework that makes sure that they're never left of center. And I think it does an enormous damage, to say the very least, to the, to the ideals of democracy and what it means for a democracy to give birth, to sustain itself by an informed public. And I think, thank God, that the alternative media are around to be able to compensate for some of this. And certainly, Henry Giroux, we celebrate independent journalism in our books at Project Censored every year, also while analyzing the din, the noise of media culture. In one of your books, Zombie Politics and Culture in the Age of Casino Capitalism, you riff on, of course, C. Wright Mills, and you talk about you know, the serious problem of anti-intellectualism. And, and certainly Chris Hedges, Susan Jacoby, the late Richard Hofstetter all talked about the problem of anti-intellectualism over the years, going back half century. But you also say that you're talking about a different kind of ignorance and anti-intellectualism. Can you talk a little about that? I think it's an anti-intellectualism that's not just about the absence of information. It's an ignorance that's about the distortion of information. And I think that's different. I think that there's a certain kind of ignorance that, you know, people just don't know anything. You know, they, they just don't have access to information. They haven't looked into the complexities of an issue. But then there's something called willful ignorance. And, you know, that's a concerted effort not to know. You know, the refusal to know. And I think that what we see in the corporate media is the latter. It's a kind of willful ignorance. You know, a concerted effort to make sure that people don't know. They don't know that government officials lie. They don't know enough about how money corrupts politics. They don't know that we no longer live in a democracy but an oligarchy. They don't know that the Koch brothers make $3 million an hour on their dividends. They don't know that the billionaires in the United States, from Gates to others, to the the Walmart family, the Waltons, are doing everything they can to destroy public education. What's censored, as you well know, given your program, what's left out is far more important than what's in. 
and, and that's a new kind of anti-intellectualism. I think that there's a kind of absent presence, a presence of absence, that the disimagination machine takes very seriously. Noam Chomsky does not appear on CNN, doesn't appear on NBC, doesn't appear on ABC, CBS. It doesn't happen. My books don't get reviewed in the New York Times or the New York Review of Books. It doesn't happen. And this is very systemic, a very systemic form of censorship. And what's unique about it is how widespread it is. Because the corporate media doesn't just own newspapers. They own television stations. They own part of the Internet. They own part of screen culture. They have the power to frame questions in ways in which the frame is so narrow that it's very difficult for people to understand the conditions that bear down on them in a way that would suggest that the society is entirely broken and that the media, the corporate media, is in part largely responsible for that or certainly bears a burden for that problem. Henry, let's talk about media and violence. The violence yeah. against poverty, the violence of the war on youth, the violence of, the, of course, the, the, the war on terrorism, and how media portrays that and the addiction that comes from that, the violence that's portrayed. Well, I think there are a number of issues. I mean, I think that, first of all, violence has become a spectacle. I mean, violence is the highest form of entertainment because it offers what appears to be the fastest route to instant gratification and pleasure, besides simply consumerism, and that the other form of consumerism, shop that you drop. I think that what you have in the culture, the popular culture, is you have this constant adulation of violence that it really sort of provides the conditions for producing a particular kind of militarized masculinity and a particular kind of celebration of violence itself. It's in, it's in sports, extreme sports, it's in the video games, it's, it's in the movies. I mean, it, I mean, we have never seen extreme violence become so visible and hence so celebrated as it is today. That's one issue. The other issue is that, as I said before, as the social state gets eliminated and its place is being taken by the punishing state, then what you essentially have is the militarization of the entire society. Aspects of society today are now militarized. I mean, whether we're talking about the militarization of schools, whether we're talking about the militarization of social spaces, whether we're talking about the paramilitarization of the police, it's very difficult not to recognize that, for the most part, what were once safe spaces in the United States increasingly are becoming war zones. The presence of violence is everywhere. And violence basically becomes not only part of the popular culture, but it becomes a, a central part of domestic terrorism, in that you increasingly have of the police being used in ways that suggest that they're, they're an occupying army. I mean, not only are they paramilitarized, not only are SWAT teams everywhere, unlike anything we've seen in the past. I forget the figure I saw recently where there were 600 of these things, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, 5,000 of them, SWAT teams in the United States. And we all know about the, you know, the weapons from Afghanistan and, of course, Iraq now being transferred uh, to, to local police stations. But I think that what becomes particularly disturbing is that violence becomes one of the few areas that we can look to, one of the few practices that we can mimic in order to solve social problems. We don't wage a war on poverty, we wage a war on the poor. We don't see young people as a long-term investment, we see them as a liability, and hence we wage war on them, particularly poor minority kids. We wage war on women, we wage war on the reproductive rights of women. I mean, these are major assaults systemically produced in the highest reaches of power. And I think in that sense, politics has become an extension of war rather than war be becoming an extension of politics. Henry Giroux, in the United States now, we, we see almost an endless kind of horse race coverage of presidential elections. And again, they're, they're virtually ceaseless. They rarely, if ever, seem to turn on anything substantive. People are just kind of waiting for zingers, one-liners, personal affects. What about this person's hair? Or add to that just the extreme nature nature of the kind of commentary that go on. And, and I would argue this is connected to the culture of violence that just permeates this culture, whether the United States is knowingly bombing a hospital in Afghanistan or whether a police officer is ripping a, a young African-American child out of her chair and throwing her across the room. You mentioned it. You said this is all part of spectacle. And yeah. let's connect that issue of spectacle to, you know, what really 
is the hallmarks of fascism to what we see in the political culture, right? You wrote yeah. recently in an interview about Donald Trump in particular. You said Trump makes clear what elements of fascism are really like. Let's be honest. The racism, the ignorance, the stupidity, the baiting, the great man affect, this notion that he exists in a circle of certainty that can't be doubted, this kind of perverse hatred of the other. And you write, we've seen this before. This should be a warning sign, yes? Oh, absolutely. Remember, one of the things that the disimagination machine does, both in schools and, of course, in, in, in the popular media, is it consistently tells us that fascism was an historical event that simply happened, like, in the 1930s. Its tentacles haven't seeped out and taken on a different form in different ways in other countries, and particularly the United States. And I think that that makes it very difficult for people to recognize that fascism is a dynamic that can take different forms, that it's not just an historical attitude fact that we can now study that once existed and no longer exists. So we have no language for linking the past to, to what's going on today. And it's one of the reasons that I constantly write about what I call the looming, if not established, forms of authoritarianism in the United States. But I think to go back, something you said that I find very interesting and very smart is that one of the forms of violence that we see, state violence, I mean, this is institutional violence that we see today, is that my argument is that the financial elite, they don't care about any ideology anymore. They're not really all that concerned about sort of educating people to be stupid. I mean, they do it, but they're so arrogant and so brazen, and their power is so removed and so unchecked, so removed from the public and so unchecked, that they're not willing to say anything. They'll say Mexicans are rapists. You know, they'll say that kids should work as janitors who get free meals. They'll body some a young African woman and then try to make the claim that it was justified, it was her fault. That shocks me. I mean, what we're now seeing is a kind of parochialness a kind of power and a kind of removal from any sense of accountability that has enshrined not just simply a culture of cruelty and legitimated it, but also has made clear the advent of a kind of lawlessness that seems unchecked, that permeates the culture. We see it in Obama with that smile while he kills wedding parties and bombs hospitals, and we see it in police chiefs who offer the stupidest kinds of commentaries on police violence. All we see it in politicians saying things that 30 years ago couldn't have been said. You know, when you have Ben Carson, a guy who is so dumb that outside of the field of science, it baffles the mind, but he's more than dumb. He's cruel. When he says that women who have been raped cannot, under any circumstances, even if their life is, is under threat, cannot have an abortion, how would you not define that as an assault? How would you not define that as part of a war on women? Mark, Marco Rubio, these white privileged males sort of dictating now who lives and who dies in a way that's not even coded, just right in your face, right in your face. Henry, you bring C. Wright Mills forward 60 years into a neoliberalism, a transnational capitalist class approach to elites so powerful, so centralized, the bankers, the U.S. military empire and NATO in support of global capital, that it becomes almost stateless. I would argue, and I'm not the first to argue this, uh, Zygmunt Bauman is actually stunning on this. I think that people often say to me, well, what's different? You know, what, what, what's different from like 20, 30 years ago? Well, I'll tell you what's different. What's different is the financial elite are global. Power is global and politics is local. And what that means is that the political institutions that we now have have no way of controlling these financial elite because they have no allegiance whatsoever to national boundaries. They float. So what we have is we have an enormous incongruity between the way power, which is capable of getting things done, and politics, which has visions of what they'd like to have done, now are at odds with each other. And I think we need to recognize that there's an enormous challenge in really thinking politics and power in a very different kind of configuration. We need a new politics for a global world. I'll give you an example of what I mean. You know, years ago, as you well know, capital and labor existed in some kind of dance, right? Where capital would say, well, we have to, you know, we have to make sure the workers are happy because otherwise they'll go on strike. Now they don't care. 
There are no political concessions anymore, no compromises. Capital no longer recognizes the value of compromises. It only recognizes the value of suppression. And I think that's what's distinctive about this really savage form of neoliberalism we have. Not only does it separate economic activity from social cost, not only does it erase any kind of ethical consideration for its own acts in, in terms of what it does to the planet and everybody else, but it's probably the most self-interested, greediest sort of value system we have ever had. But what now is different, it has global power. That global power gets manifested worldwide. It's austerity. It's uh, top-down neoliberalism. And, and it's coming home to roost here in the U.S. as well. What people don't realize, they look at Greece and they say, oh, my God. I mean, you know, these austerity measures are killing people. People are committing suicide. They don't have jobs. Their retirements are being eliminated. They're now being forced to pay for health care. They're living in the streets. They're going to garbage cans. You'll see the same thing in the same way in the United States. I mean, they're wiping out the middle class. When I listen to these Republican candidates talk about how they want to eliminate Social Security, they want to eliminate social provisions, they want to dismantle the welfare state, do away with the Department of Education. I mean, we know what this all means. I mean, what this all means is they will do anything to consolidate class power and their own profits, even if it means killing the planet and eliminating 95% of the population or relegating, this, relegating them to simply nothing more than survival tactics. That's how ruthless this is. And I think in that sense, one could argue it bears an eerie resemblance to a, a kind of fascism that is not even self-conscious about its own population. We're speaking with Professor Henry Giraud, and we will continue this conversation after a brief musical break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Helf with Peter Phillips. Today, for the hour, we're speaking with Professor Henry Giraud. He is a prolific author and cultural critic. And we, before the break, we were talking about the concentration of wealth globally, the proliferation of poverty. And Henry Giraud, through the policies of neoliberalism, this is all by design. And this is, of course, also, again, you're, you're riffing on the term fascism. Can you talk a little bit more about this gulf, this we have record level of inequality in terms of the the one percent owning over half of the global wealth according to an oxfam report earlier this year well it's worse than that. it's worse than that i mean yes one percent owns half the global wealth the global wealth in the united states 400 families own 50 percent of the wealth 85 of the richest individuals own one half of the world's wealth i mean no there's no way that we can talk about economic and social justice in the midst of that kind of inequality i mean that kind of inequality is not just about rich people being successful it's about rich people holding power and defining that power in ways that benefits their own interest. I mean, this really, if one had to point to the hallmark of a kind of new authoritarianism in which a different kind of class, the financial elite, now have imposed a form of sovereignty on all aspects of life, we have now arrived at that point. I mean, governments are now not controlled by, by anybody but the corporate elite. I mean, I, and this is not even a conspiracy theory. As you well know, there was a study recently that came out of Princeton University in which they argued that in the last 50 years, something like 90 percent, 85 to 90 percent of all policies had nothing to do with the needs of people. They had nothing to do with what people wanted. This is not exactly the center of Marxist thought. 
I mean, Princeton University then concluded we live in an oligarchy. We don't have a democracy because the reins of government have now been taken over by the financial elite. Whether we're talking about the role of lobbyists, that we're talking about the role of big money. I mean, I mean, when I watch these candidates on both sides, maybe the exception of Bernie Sanders, although he's caught in a contradiction, he doesn't quite understand. What you're really talking about is you're talking about different sides of the financial elite basically controlling you know, how government works, what can be said and what can't be said and what policies can be implemented. Henry Zero, you have spoken about this. You've kind of riffed on the idea of zombie zombie culture. In the two Project Censored books back, uh, Zara Zimbardo wrote a chapter for us called It's Easier to Imagine the Zombie Apocalypse Than to Imagine the End of Capitalism. Again, that's also kind of kind of playing off with Fre- Frederick Jameson. Talk to us a little bit more about that, that metaphor and that idea that in terms of zombie capitalism. I wrote the book because I, the notion of zombie became, became a metaphor for me of, that seemed off at two levels. I mean, at one level, it spoke to the way in which people now, more and more people, increasingly find themselves living a zombie-like existence because they're struggling not to get ahead, but to simply survive. I mean, the blood has been sucked out of them, the life has been sucked out of them by a, a financial elite, corporate elite, military elite, who really have transformed American life into a kind of zombie zone. But secondly, the notion of zombie also refers, as I say in, said in the book, to a financial elite who are really the walking dead. I mean, these people, they have no conscience. They could care less about what it means to be alive. They basically do everything they, they can to thrive parasitically on the lives and aspirations and resources of most of the world. And we truly live in a zombie culture by virtue of the way in which neoliberal capitalism, global capitalism, is combined with a number of other anti-democratic tendencies, religious fundamentalism, racism, to consolidate a world and create a world that really resembles a TV program. It resembles zombie land. I think that metaphor is quite apt in order to sort of point to the urgency of the conditions, anti-democratic conditions in which we now find ourselves. You talk about the isolation of the writ, the 1,000th of 1%, 7,000 individuals at at the highest pinnacles of power, the Bilderberger Group, the Trilateral Commission, and and, and the G8, the G20, policy making that's implemented by uh, deep state activities around the world and, and, and various secret police actions and a variety of different things. The isolation of the rich, they're in towers, literally, protected in many cases by private military companies and private security companies like G4S. That, that's just massive. They're so isolated. So, you know, when the Occupy movement goes, gives us a mantra of 99 versus 1 percent, and that stays with us, and then if we can have a radical pedagogy that, that helps people recognize what's going on, from a critical perspective inside of public education and, and around the country, th- there is some hope, I think. And- absolutely. I think it's absolutely crucial. I, I mean, I think that, you know, part of the struggle in, in any revolution, and this is basically what we're dealing with, we're dealing with a, a counter-revolution that needs to be challenged and eliminated. I think that one of the most formative and important stages in mobilizing against power and holding it accountable is to make it visible. And I think you make it visible through language, you make it visible through direct action, you make it visible through unifying a fragmented left. I think that we're increasingly seeing conditions that are so severe that either people are going to end up in a a strictly authoritarian country or there's going to be mass mobilizations. And I want to think more on the side of mass mobilizations. I mean, we see them happening in Latin America. We see alternatives developing there. We see it in places like Greece and Spain, even though it happens slowly, it's becoming clear that what has been recognized that is particularly among young people is that capitalism and democracy are not the same thing, that they're not the same thing, that that language is no longer credible. And the question now becomes is, how do you redefine this notion of radical democracy? What does it mean to be inclusive, to take questions of justice, economic and political and social justice seriously? I mean, what does it mean to dignify human agency? What does it mean to uphold the commons? And I think that more and more as these contradictions develop, the lies that we hear, the, the arrogance, the stupidity that we see in the political realms in most of these neoliberal countries is becoming pretty translucent, pretty transparent. And I'm just hoping that, particularly in the United States, that we can get beyond the fragmentation of the left, take questions of education seriously, and really develop third parties and larger social movements that can begin to engage in direct action and challenge these interests. Uh, Henry Giroux, that's precisely it. We see a great possibility of the power between merging public intellectuals, educators, students, others really struggling in the society for equality to create, really, a more vibrant democratic culture. And one 
the ways that we've been doing that at Project Censored over the decades is through media literacy. We have a new joint project with the Action Coalition for Media Education, a graduate program at Sacred Heart University in media literacy and digital culture. And we have a new thing called the Global Critical Media Literacy Project, where we're working as an extension of Project Censored with campuses all over the U.S. in particular. And, you know, the focus is media literacy. The focus is critical thinking and trying to give people the tools to recognize and understand the problems here that you've been deconstructing so eloquently, but not just to expose the problems, but to also celebrate the creativity involved in coming up with solutions. And I think we all really need to push the idea that there are people already involved and engaged in solutions. And I think we really need to work harder to kind of highlight those and uncensor those, because as you said earlier, you know, the corporate media, not only do they not tell us some of the terrible things that, that go on, but they don't tell us about pro-democracy movements. They don't tell us about the people that are really working for change and making things happen. I think you're absolutely right. I think that when we talk about critical thinking, I like the term, but I, I, I like Paulo Freire's term, critical consciousness. And I think that what he was implying was we're not just talking about thinking, right? We're talking about the way in which being critical also suggests being intervening in the world and not just being able to understand it. And I think that as you suggested, I'm not interested in a notion of literacy or a notion of civic literacy or critical literacy that is only about teaching people how to critique power structures. I'm really interested in both how they can learn the language of critique and its skills, but at the same time also be cultural producers. We have a whole generation of young people, believe me, I mean, given their imaginations, given their skills, given the, the way in which they can work with this media, they're not going to work for Disney and do anything that makes any sense. I mean, they're not going to work for corporate media and do anything that makes any sense. They may have one foot in and work that is just to be able to survive. But the real issue is in the outlying spheres, in, in the alternative spheres, where they can produce radio shows, where they can produce a proliferation of public spheres in which real critical work in forms of films, magazine writing, op-eds, schools, alternative schools, all these things, the ways that they can educate teachers who are in the schools, where, you know, you have a vibrant public sphere sort of operating in ways that suggest that another world is possible, to use that cliche, but that's true. I think that without this kind of general pedagogical nurturing of the will to address questions of justice, justice dies in us. And I think that without this language of possibility and without the attempt to elevate the production of agency, real agents, people who understand the world and people who can intervene in the world, cultural critics, cultural producers. That's an essence of civic literacy that I like. I particularly like your idea of critical consciousness and, and recognize that in students as they emerge oftentimes in, in many of, uh, of our classes that we do through Project Censored and, and, and related areas. I mean, it just seems incredibly important to develop a consciousness that is continually questioning, continually looking at the root causes of inequality, racism, and injustices. And, and to an extent, you, you accept that Bernie Sanders highlights kind of a lack of democracy, and he talks about the big banks and health care and single-payer issues, Social Security, and that he does so from a kind of a reason, justice, and logic problem. But you write that the problem is he's in the Democratic Party, <laughs> and, and that's a corporate party as, as well as a Republican, and, and it's the corporate election. So having a critical consciousness becomes increasingly more important, and actions that engage in those kinds of things seems more important, and, and we see young people doing that on a daily basis. I mean, you look at the Black Lives Movement. I mean, they're doing something, in my estimation, it's unbelievable. I mean, they're not only making international connections with other youth movements, but they're talking about wider structures of domination. They're not just talking about making the police wear cameras. They're talking about systemic violence and how it works and how you have to connect one thing to the other. When the, when the uh, Quebec students went on strike because the tuition was being raised in Quebec, they said, hey, look, this isn't just about self-interest. We're not just concerned about lowering tuitions for ourselves. We're concerned about an entire attack on the social state. You know, the attack on social provisions, the attack on the welfare state, the attack on, on a whole range of things. And I think that what young people are starting to recognize is that they've got to think in terms of a totality. It, right? I mean, they've got to be able to relate isolated incidents to larger social issues. If we can't educate young people to engage, or maybe they need to educate us, to engage in particular modes of translation, as C. Wright Mills once said, connecting the personal to the public, connecting the isolated issues to large systemic issues, and each informing the other, we're in big trouble. 
There's no question about that. But I think we're starting to see that because the language of politics as it exists now erases politics. It makes it irrelevant in any fundamentally democratic way. And I think that we've never seen a youth movement that I think is more attuned to that. We're speaking with Professor Henry Giraud, and we will conclude our interview with him today after this brief musical break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Project Censored show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff with Peter Phillips. Today's program, we've been spending the hour with Professor Henry Giroux, and we began our conversation talking about uh, critical pedagogy. And let's go back to that issue, Henry Giroux. Let's go back to, again, the significance of education. And then let's talk about, you know, how can we maybe reignite some of this imagination, creativity, and, and how can we really move the left sort of back into the civic sphere in, in a meaningful way. One of the first things that we need to do is we need to take seriously the question of the radical imagination. And what I mean by that is that we need to take seriously what it means to reclaim the question of democracy in a way that matters. That's the issue. We've got to, in some way, redefine what democracy is so that it's not just simply correlated with capitalism, and it certainly is not something that would suggest that its ultimate essence lies in simply elections that are already rigged. Secondly, it seems to me we need to take the question of education seriously, a broad-based understanding of education, one in which it seems to me we recognize that we have to have a sense of politics being educative, of politics changing the way people see things. I mean, I think the left is in trouble. It's not got an independent analysis in ways that suggest that you need to be able to work hard to enlighten people to raise their consciousness in ways that suggest a long-term struggle that's fundamental to politics itself. I mean, we need to recognize, as I said earlier, we've underestimated the symbolic and pedagogical dimensions of, and we haven't forged the appropriate weapons to fight, as Pierre Bourdieu once said, on that front. We've got to recognize that education and the creation of a formative culture that inspires and energizes people who are critical, people who are ethical, people who can reclaim a sense of social responsibility is absolutely crucial to a politics of the 21st century, particularly a century in which culture now is really the great educator. We're not just talking about schools. I mean, I mean, culture is the educator. And so the question becomes, where are the public spheres that make that kind of culture, that educative understanding of politics possible? Certainly the battles in the universities between you're here to get a job, you're here to yeah. have, a, have a degree, that's all that counts, and a lack of awareness or a lack of understanding or critical analysis of what's going on in society and the impacts it's having, that issue. And certainly the idea that academics have a duty to the public, to the common good, critical to understand what's going on to society and how people come out of these universities that have some kind of an awareness and understanding what's really happening and we're being challenged of course institutionally to to basically shut up and go shopping to, to use a Bob McChesney quote and that becomes the agenda inside of public education and, and the funding goes that way as well I think you've just said something that to me is enormously crucial if we really want to begin with reclaiming education and as, as central to politics itself, then we've got to find a way to claim that one of the major assaults leading the United States into the dark uh, night of fascism and authoritarianism resides in the assault on public and higher education because they're one of the few public spheres left where we can actually imagine students being educated in a way in which they can truly raise the question, what's the role of education in a democracy? What does it mean? What has to be done for democracy to be viable vis-a-vis -vis the formative cultures that education can produce, the agents they can produce, desires they can mobilize, and the kind of practices and knowledges that they can legitimate? That's a fundamental question that's missing from the debate on education. To be honest with you, I cannot understand how educators have allowed this neoliberal apparatus to strip higher education of its most profound element, and that is the faculty. It's distilled them, it's technicized them, and it's made them irrelevant. Seventy percent of all faculty are on part-time jobs, a contingent. 
on part-time contracts and not on the tenure line in the university. That's just absolutely stunning. I mean, we talk about what's happened to manufacturing, and that's tragic. But what's happened to education is worse. And I think the question that has to be raised is why isn't that being raised by the left and progressives as truly the essence of what we might call a really poisonous attack on our democracy? Well, Henry Giroux, uh, in the few minutes we have left, what do you believe one of the avenues is here to really kind of energize the left and, and really elevate the, the discourse to, to a position that looks you know, at, at the really macro significance of education, public education? I think there should be a national movement that brings various elements of the left together without eliminating whatever particular issues that they're dealing with around what it means to defend what I would call a movement for the commons and the public good. And I know that may sound tame, but it's not tame. We need to raise the discourse not just about inequality but we need to raise the discourse about what people have in common that they have to defend in order for society not to survive but to thrive a defense of the public good because the public good includes a whole range of institutions from the air we breathe i would think an environment to the institutions such as schools and then we can begin to link together a variety of issues that would address that issue we can say okay look what's the relationship between an attack on the public a good in the rise of the mass incarceration state. What does that have to say about what's happening in schools? How do we talk about the increasing systemic violence in the United States along those lines? We need some kind of movement in which there is a relationship between the, these individual problems and this larger totality. Secondly, we need a third party. We need a third party. I mean, we need a party that unites youth, African Americans, minorities of class and color, ethnicity, that brings people together in ways in which they can challenge the moneyed interest of the United States. Thirdly, we need to recognize that this is a global movement and we need to make connections with other movements. Fourth, we need to do it in ways in which people can identify with the kind of rhetoric and the kind of language that we have. We need to learn how to be persuasive when we're talking to people. We need the people who support Trump to be able to say, wait a minute, he's an idiot. You know, here are the people who are really talking about protecting our own dignity and, and chance of, of living a good life in the United States and being able to recognize with compassion the problems that other people have and how they're related. So we're speaking with Professor Henry Giroux. He has joined us for the hour today. He holds the McMaster University Chair for Scholarship in the Public Interest in the English and Cultural Studies Department and is the Apollo Freire Chair in Critical Pedagogy at McMaster Institute for Innovation and Excellence in Teaching and Learning. He's now a distinguished visiting professor at Ryerson University, prolific author of 60-some books. You can learn more at henryagiroux.com. That's G-I-R-O-U. X, and we urge listeners to, if you aren't familiar with Henry Giraud, we strongly believe you ought to be. And uh, you heard Henry talking earlier about Howard Zinn and you know um, Noam Chomsky, people that have uh, had connections to Project Censored over the years. Uh, we really put Henry Giraud in, in the same category as these really instrumental and radical and revolutionary thinkers. You can also find his work at truthout.org. Thank you so much for taking time out and joining the Project Censored show today. Thank you so much for having me on. And that does it for the Project Censored show today on Pacifica Radio. Special thanks to our producer, Anthony Fest. Our engineer is Erica Bridgman. The Project Censored show airs on over 25 stations around the U.S. Archives can be found online at projectcensored.org. Please follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you next time. Stay tuned for Terra Verde. Why should the black man in America uh, concern himself since we've been away from the African continent for 400 years, three or 400 years? Why should we concern ourselves? What impact does what happened to them have upon us? Number one. I'm gentleman, for news, information, and analysis about Africa and the African diaspora, tune in weekly on Mondays at 7 p.m. to Africa Today with your host, Walter Turner. Africa Today is your source for being up to date on Africa and African. Mondays at 7 p.m., Africa Today on your Pacifica radio station, KPFA 94.1 FM. I
Would you or someone you know like to join KPFA's Community Advisory Board? Members of the KPFA Community Advisory Board, called the CAB, sponsor meetings and gather information from individuals and organizations and provide input back to the KPFA Local Station Board and management about our community's special needs for programming, community service, and how the station's policy decisions impact the community and relate to KPFA's mission. CAB members are volunteers appointed for three years. If you would like to find out more about becoming a member of the Community Advisory Board, please email cab at kpfa.org with your contact information and a statement of interest or go to the kpfa.org website and click on the Community Advisory Board 